God going to war against his enemies. You might sort of see where I'm going with this in the return of Jesus, but let me just read you something that Jesus said and keep that in the back of your mind, this whole Passover warfare thing. In Luke 22, 15 to 16, right before he's crucified, Jesus says to his disciples, I've earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer, for I say to you, I shall never again eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. So Jesus places the fulfillment of Passover not at the cross. He places the fulfillment of Passover when he comes back in the kingdom of God. You see this? And I used to go to churches and teach on Passover and do the kind of Passover Seder, and I'd always come across that verse, and that's where I started seeing kind of like the glitch in the Matrix, you know? Um, Matrix is an amazing movie on so many levels, but Neo, played by, what's his name, Keanu Reeves, he's in like this computer program. Everyone's plugged into a computer program, and they're just like zombies, and they're like sleeping somewhere, so everything they see isn't real. And then uh, there's like this glitch you can see. It's like a cat. He sees like a cat walking like two times. He sees the same thing, and he, it's like called a glitch in the matrix, and it shows you that like something is wrong with with the reality. You're not living in the real reality. That's the whole point of the, the matrix for those who are wondering why I'm talking about the matrix in this message. So my point is, I kept seeing this statement by Jesus talking about Passover being fulfilled in the kingdom. And I was like, why is everybody saying Jesus already fulfilled Passover? What in the world is he talking about? I'm coming back to fulfill the Passover. And the funny thing is that his disciples would have known exactly what he was talking about because when you read the, the Passover um, story, but then also a lot of prophecies that come later, like Isaiah, Ezekiel, Habakkuk, Joel talked about one, they all tell the story of the Lord's return using the story of the Passover in Exodus, right? So they all are basically saying, when the Messiah comes back, he's coming to basically rehash and relive the Exodus story in a greater way. I'll go through some of the passages, but just like summary, because it's amazing. It's like Jesus is literally coming back as a mighty divine warrior. There's passages that talk about him going into Egypt to deliver Israelites who will be exiled during the time of Jacob's trouble. There's passages that talk about the Messiah coming out of Egypt with Israel, parting the Red Sea, going to Mount Sinai, marching up to Jerusalem, and destroying the powers of darkness and the armies of the Antichrist with the exact same plagues that Moses used against Pharaoh. That is all over the Hebrew Bible. It's everywhere. So when Jesus is saying this, I'm coming back to fulfill Passover, guys, and then we're going to celebrate it in the kingdom, they knew what he was talking about. And uh, this was actually a, a very common Jewish view back then as well. But I'll talk about that in a minute. I just wanted to kind of speed through a few passages um, so you'll have some background. The first is in Isaiah 19, and it talks about the Son of Man, the... Uh, as Joel calls him, the cloud rider. <laughs> I love it. Behold, the Lord is riding on a swift cloud and is about to come to Egypt. The idols of Egypt will tremble at his presence. And that word literally means his face. So it's often used for God in a physical form. Who would that be? And the heart of the Egyptians will melt within them. So Isaiah is talking about the Messiah riding on a cloud and going to Egypt and making Egypt shake at his presence. Sounds kind of like the Exodus story. Then if you go to Habakkuk 3, Joel quoted part of that earlier where it talks about the Messiah marching up from Saudi Arabia up into Israel, and it kind of makes sense. Why? So he's coming from Egypt based on Isaiah 19, he, re, he crosses the Red Sea, 
There are passages that talk about that, won't get into it. And then he's marching up. But then in Habakkuk 3, it says this, before him goes pestilence and plagues come after, the, after him. He stood and surveyed the earth. He looked and startled the nations. Yes, the perpetual mountains were shattered and the ancient hills collapsed. So it talks about Jesus marching on this war path from the south and using plagues and pestilence against his enemies. And then in Ezekiel 38, the famous Gog of Magog, which is this really panoramic view of the Great Tribulation and the Antichrist invasion or Gog's invasion of Israel, and then the one who comes back to deal with Gog or the Antichrist would be Jesus. And this is what it says about how God will enter into judgment or how God will enter into judgment with Gog or the Antichrist. He says in Ezekiel 38, 22 to 23, with pestilence and with blood, I will enter into judgment with him. So God says he's going to enter into judgment with the Antichrist through pestilence and blood. Plagues of pestilence and blood. And I will reign on him and on his troops and on the many peoples who are with him. Torrential rain with hailstones, fire, and brimstone. So you can see the Exodus motif there, the plague motif, right? Blood, hail, fire, brimstone. And there's a long-standing Jewish tradition, not within Christianity, I just mean like within Judaism, that they all read this story as connected to the Exodus. So they understood that this is about the Messiah coming back to defeat Israel's enemies as like this miracle-working new Moses. And he's going to do it with these plagues, the same ones that Moses used against Pharaoh. And in the time of Jesus, again, this was very well understood. The predominant way that Jews in the time of Jesus really looked at the Messiah coming and establishing his kingdom, when they thought about it, they were thinking Passover. They were thinking Exodus. They were thinking the Messiah is coming back as this new Moses to, to do this, which is pretty amazing when you start trying to think about the real details of what Jesus is going to do when he returns and how uh, specific that is. So Passover being fulfilled in the kingdom is Jesus coming back as a mighty warrior to crush his enemies on the battlefield. That is the fulfillment of Passover that Jesus is talking about in Luke 22 that is tied back to all of these other prophecies. And there, there are dozens of them, but those are three big ones. Exodus 19, Habakkuk 3, and uh, Ezekiel 38, 22. And uh, it sometimes comes up like, am I saying Jesus has to come back on Passover then? And I don't really get into too much date setting. I'm not really one who's going to say it has to be this or this. What I could say is, based on everything you see, there is a strong case that he could come back in the spring right before Passover. You know, it would really make a lot of sense. And then when you start getting into uh, Jewish sources as well, probably the main, if not one of the main ideas in the first century when Jesus lived was that the Messiah would establish his kingdom right before Passover. So they were all looking forward to the kingdom at this time of year. And so is that when Jesus is going to come back sometime in the early spring, right around Passover? It's definitely possible. I lean that way. I won't be surprised, but I'm not dogmatic. The only thing I'm dogmatic about is you have to have a fulfillment of Passover in your whole return of Jesus feast paradigm because, you know, Jesus did himself. So you have to have that on your radar and we can debate and work out timing. So I'm going to go through the remaining. So what comes next after Passover and those other early spring feasts? is the Feast of Weeks. And the Feast of Weeks was 
the primary uh, spring harvest festival. It was really the, the um, barley and wheat harvest in particular, which was about 49 days after, uh, let me make sure I get this right. Can we go back to the last slide? Uh, yeah, so it's um, 49 days after, like right around first, like first fruits. So the early first fruits is two days after Passover, and then the Feast of Weeks is the completion of the spring harvest. So it was all about them bringing in their wheat. So they would go to the temple, and they would bring their wheat to the temple and make these offerings, and then that's when they could start harvesting their crops in Israel. So it's a, it's a harvest festival. Now, we know, for example, from Acts chapter 2, that the Holy Spirit and the nations were harvested on the Feast of Weeks in the first century, right? So God did that sort of prophetic thing and poured out the Holy Spirit at the time of the Feast of Weeks. So that's another reason why some people say, well, this has already been fulfilled. But if you really look at the prophets and what, what they say happens after Jesus comes back as this warrior, what do the prophets say happens next? They start talking about this massive harvest from the nations coming to Jerusalem. And they use the language of the Feast of Weeks. And then they start talking about this great outpouring of the Holy Spirit after Jesus comes back to the earth. So they're using all of this Feast of Weeks Pentecost language to describe what's happening in the early days of the millennium. So one passage is uh, Isaiah 66, 18. Because let me mention too, Joel, I think, touched on this last night. But when Jesus comes back, not everyone is just going to be killed. There will be survivors from the nations who will, uh, who will be sur surviving and still in the nations. So in interesting to keep that in mind. If we can go two slides forward. Yeah, this whole harvest idea. So Isaiah says... The time is coming to gather all the nations and tongues, and they shall come and see my glory. I will set a sign among them and will send survivors from them to the nations. So Jesus comes back, and he's sending people out to the nations. Tarshish, Put, Lud, Meshach, Tubal, Javan, to the distant coastlands, like all over the world, that have neither heard my fame nor seen my glory. And they will declare my glory to the nations, so people going out when Jesus comes back to preach the gospel to survivors. Then they shall bring all your brethren from all the nations as a grain offering to the Lord. That's the exact same word in Isaiah 66 that's used for the offering at the time of the Feast of Weeks. Same exact word. It's a general word, so it could have some wide connotations, but it's just interesting to me, you have this Feast of Weeks language that's being used about events in the millennium and the nations being gathered to the Lord as this offering on horses and chariots, on mules, on camels, to my holy city, my holy mountain, Jerusalem, just as the sons of Israel bring their grain offering in a clean vessel to the house of the Lord. So just as people on the Feast of Weeks would bring their grain offering, that was when the biggest grain offering was made in Israel during the year. Isaiah is giving that kind of a prophetic spin. Interesting. Then that's like the physical regathering side. So we're kind of there. We're raptured and with Jesus and in Jerusalem, going through the Exodus in Jerusalem. The party has kind of started for us, but there's still people coming in from the nations, probably over a period of. I don't know, a month or so, who knows. But then on the spiritual side, Joel chapter 2, 28 to 29, this great Pentecost prophecy, he says, it will come about after this that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind, and your sons and your daughters will prophesy, and your old men will dream dreams, your young men will see visions, even on the male and female servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. If you go and read Joel chapter 2, it's all about the kingdom and the second coming. So when Joel says 
it will come about after this that I'll pour out my spirit. If you go read the context, he's talking about after the Messiah defeats Israel's enemies. That's when the greatest outpouring of the Holy Spirit ever in the history of mankind will happen, when Jesus is back on the earth. And so it's kind of like the second coming is like the second coming or the true coming of the Holy Spirit. Like we get and the world gets the Holy Spirit in fullness in the millennium. It's not like we just have the Spirit here. The Spirit is the primary transformative agent who's going to be used by Jesus and the Father to transform the world during the millennium. Joel is saying the Holy Spirit is poured out when the Messiah returns, and there's going to be words of prophecy and dreams and visions. It's all still coming. And every little revival that we see until then, everything that happened on Pentecost in the book of Acts, that's all just like a little shadow. That's like a little inbreaking of the kingdom now. So I'm all about revival. I'm all about seeking the Holy Spirit and asking the Lord to partially fulfill Joel chapter 2, but the real fulfillment of Joel chapter 2 is in the kingdom, and the Holy Spirit is going to be doing mighty things. Paul said in Romans 8, 23, that until the kingdom, until we get our, our new bodies and Jesus comes back, we only have the first fruits of the Spirit. So now we only get a little taste. So you can see already just with those spring feasts, it flows pretty naturally in terms of like Passover, Jesus is the warrior king defeating his enemies, Feast of Weeks, the nations are gathered, the spirits poured out. It really flows pretty well. So then we can go to the next slide. You come to the Feast of Trumpets. And this is where it gets like really controversial because um, people are like, Oh, Jesus comes back with the trumpet and the rapture. That's got to be the Feast of Trumpets, right? Well, for me, it's not necessarily that simple because trumpets were used throughout the year in Israel. They were used at every major festival on the Sabbath. They were used on the battlefield. Trumpets are used all over, just like you see animals everywhere. So what I'm saying is you can't take a New Testament passage where Paul mentions a trumpet and say this is the fulfillment of the Feast of Trumpets because that would be like saying everywhere I see the word lamb in the Bible, it's talking about Passover. Does that make sense? Words can be used in different contexts. It's the context that determines. And so it's not clear when Paul talks about a trumpet or when Jesus talks about a trumpet, even though people make other claims, it's not clear that that's actually talking about the Feast of Trumpets and its fulfillment. Again, I'm not big on timing or anything, but there's more to the stories. And so we have to, again, go back to what did the Feast of Trumpets mean historically to an ancient Israelite? What did they think about? So first of all, it's not even called the Feast of Trumpets. It's actually called Zichron Teruah. So it is... Those two words, zichron is like a remembrance or a memorial. It's from a root that means to remember. And teruah is a word that means shouting or a loud sound. It could be like a human shout, the blast of a trumpet. It has different meaning, kind of crossover meaning. So in the seventh month, in the fall, on the first day of the seventh month, God told Israel, I want you to have a memorial where you blast the trumpet and shout to the Lord and just make a, a mighty noise to the Lord and have this remembrance. And so you say, well, what were they remembering? Why is it so vague? Why doesn't he tell us what we're remembering? Well, <laughs> remember, when Israel gets the law and the Feast of Trumpets legislation, where are they? They're at Mount Sinai. How did God manifest himself at Mount Sinai? With the blast of a trumpet. He came down upon the mountain. They heard the blast of the trumpet. They were terrified. They saw this mighty glory. And so in Jewish tradition, there's this common understanding. Even if you were to go to a Feast of Trumpets celebrations today in like a traditional Jewish synagogue, 
which they call Rosh Hashanah, the new year. That's a whole nother story. But it's the Feast of Trumpets. You would get a lot of references in the Jewish liturgy to Mount Sinai. And the Mount Sinai story is part of the reading in Jewish synagogues on the Feast of Trumpets. So what I'm saying is what they are remembering, what the Lord is saying for the Feast of Trumpets, he is saying, remember your encounter with me at Mount Sinai. So with Passover, they're remembering the Exodus. With the Feast of Weeks, they're honoring God as their provider. And then when you come to the seventh month, he's plugging them back into the Exodus story. And he's saying, have a zichron teruah, have a remembrance of trumpet blast to remember the Sinai encounter and to remember your covenant with me as, as your God. There's also a flip side to the coin this whole element of a trumpet, why he's telling them to do that is because in the Bible and in the ancient world where Israel lived, the, the formal enthronement of a king, let's say, was often announced with a trumpet blast. So when the king actually began to reign and took up his throne, you've probably seen this in movies, like I have a whole uh, quote from the, the Return of the King, the third Lord of the Rings in my book. Um, where the, at the end of the Lord of the Rings, he's enthroned, the, the king, Aragorn, he's enthroned with the sound of the trumpet. So what God is saying is in the seventh month, when you remember Sinai and you blow the trumpet, really what you're doing is you are remembering that encounter at the mountain, but you're enthroning me as your king. It's like kind of a, a coronation ceremony, you could say. Okay, so, so that's kind of the historical background on it. Let me see, I had a quote here. Oh yeah, okay, I'll get to that in a minute. So when you then start reading the prophets, I'm looking for where are they using the language of not just like a trumpet, but where are they using the language of the Feast of Trumpets like Teruah? Where, where is that concept showing up for them prophetically? Not so much just like, um, oh, I see a trumpet here, I see a trumpet here. I'm, I'm looking for clues in the Hebrew Bible for the prophets to tell me how they view the future uh, fulfillment of the Feast of Trumpets. I guess you could say it like that. And there's a few references, but I would say Psalm 47, 5 to 9 is one of the biggest because this is an enthronement psalm about the future enthronement of the Messiah on Mount Zion. So it says, and you could interpret all of these verbs with like a future tense. It's kind of the way Hebrew works and the way prophecy works. Sometimes it sounds like the past, but they're actually talking about the future kind of thing. It's how the Hebrew perfect tense works. It's not always just like past. It's sort of future as well. It's an incomplete, or no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, I got to be better here. Sorry. Okay. I know there's like one Hebrew speaker here, so I have to get this right. <laughs> um, what's that? Yes. Right. It's like a completed action from the vantage point of the speaker, but it doesn't mean the action's totally completed in real time. Like if you had a dream... You know, and you were like, um, or, yes, okay, yes, thank you. Yes, yes, yes. That's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> the, the prophets are saying things that they saw, right? So they use what sort of sounds like the past, but they're talking about things in the future. That's, that's all I was saying. So here's Psalm 47, 5 to 9. God has ascended with a shout. That word is teruah. The Lord with the sound of a trumpet. So you have real, like, strong Feast of Trumpets connotations in Psalm 47, 5. And then he says, sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our king. Sing praises. For God is king of all the earth. Sing praises with a skillful psalm. God reigns over the nations God sits 
on his holy throne. The princes of the people have assembled themselves as the people of the God of Abraham, for the shields of the earth belong to God. He is highly exalted. So they're kind of saying that what happened at Sinai is happening again in the Messianic age. That as God came down with a trumpet blast at Sinai and the peoples were praising him, he's saying in this psalm that God, or you could read this as God in the flesh, God is going, he's ascending. So he's going up his mountain with the sound of shouts and trumpet blasts. He's, ta- he's officially sitting on his throne and beginning to reign after all of the nations have been, been gathered. So again, you can see kind of the progression. Passover, Feast of Weeks, they're all gathered. And then you start, as you get deeper into the millennium, you start to get these passages that talk about the Messiah actually beginning to reign and formally sitting on his throne on his holy mountain, which is kind of like a picture from what happened at Sinai. And then there's passages about the Messiah giving the nations his law. So they're using all of this Sinai Feast of Trumpets kind of language. And that's, that's the only thing I really want to emphasize there is that the Feast of Trumpets is fulfilled when the nations are gathered and Jesus ascends Mount Zion and they blow the trumpet and all the nations bow down before him and he's formally enthroned and formally crowned and all of that. So it's something that's kind of more in the millennium than just like at the moment of the second coming or the rapture. Now again, whatever you want to think about timing of all that, I'm just saying there's more to the Feast of Trumpets that takes you deeper into the millennial kind of storyline That's really important to understand because if you celebrate the Feast of Trumpets like we do in my family, you know, this is what you're actually doing. This is what you're actually anticipating. You are remembering and looking back, but you're also kind of remembering and looking forward to the Messianic age. So we blow the trumpet in my house because we're proclaiming God as king, just like at Sinai, but we're beginning to proclaim the reign of the Messiah from Mount Zion. That's what the Feast of Trumpets is really about. It's the formal establishment of the Messiah's kingship over all the earth. And I have to read this quote from, I I think he's like a Hasidic rabbi, uh, like a real ultra-Orthodox kind of stream. And he says that uh, in the prayers of Rosh Hashanah or Feast of Trumpets, when we refer to God in terms of kingship and ruling, so he uses that kingship theme, We are asking for an extension of the scope of his kingship until every created thing will understand that he created it, that he is king. And then he says, the ultimate expression of the theme of kingship on the Feast of Trumpets is our request that God's kingship will reach the ultimate revelation of the days of Mashiach, of Messiah. So it's one of these cases where the Jewish rabbis actually get it more right Because he's saying exactly what Psalm 47 is saying. He's saying when we celebrate Rosh Hashanah or Feast of Trumpets, we're yearning for the Mashiach, the Messiah, to come back and reign and extend his kingship over everyone, over all the earth, after all the nations have been gathered. Because like modern Orthodox Jews, they don't really know about the rapture, so they're not like thinking about the rapture when they think about the Feast of Trumpets. They're plugged into a different stream, and I think that um, it's, a, it's a very valuable stream. It's, I say that the Feast of Trumpets is really a, a dress rehearsal for the Messianic age and the reign of uh, Jesus. So I will fly through these last two. Go to the next slide, please. The Day of Atonement, because they really... Um, the Day of Atonement and the Feast of Tabernacles, along with Feast of Trumpets, all of these happen uh, within a very short uh, window. It's, um, it's like a 14-day window. So Feast of Trumpets is on the first of the seventh month, and then 10 days later is the Day of Atonement, and then I believe four days later is the Feast of Tabernacles. So they all kind of go together. And so when you look at the Day of Atonement, And you think about, like, 
okay, so how is that revealing what Jesus might be doing when he comes back? I'll just keep it very simple. Historically, the Day of Atonement was about purifying the temple, the space where God actually lived among his people. Israelites didn't think about the Day of Atonement so much in terms of like, I'm getting saved, like my salvation, my eternal life and sins. They weren't thinking so much about that. The Day of Atonement was about the high priest removing sin through blood from the sacred space of the temple and removing the sin from the people too because the whole idea was that a holy God cannot live in impure space. So every year the purification has to be repeated because Israel is still unclean. They're still sinners. They still go to the bathroom and, you know, do all these unclean things. So the idea is like, you can't have God living in, the, in his house down the street with everything a mess, with all these unclean humans, you know? So there's this idea of purifying the space where God dwells. And then when you go to the prophets, they start using all of this atonement language for what? For a couple main things. For the purification of Israel and the nations through the Spirit. So remember, there's going to be people who are like not saved and they come into the kingdom and get saved. So Ezekiel talks about them coming back to the land and God sprinkling clean water on them. And he says, you'll be clean. I'll cleanse you from all your impurities. That's exact day of atonement language. That's in Ezekiel 36 to 20, 24 to 25. He's using day of atonement language to describe the purification of Israel and the nations by extension. And then also, there's a lot of passages as you get into, uh, especially like Ezekiel 39 and 40, when it starts talking about the temple, that the Messiah is going to come back and build this temple. There's a lot of atonement language there too, because think about when Jesus comes back, he's coming back as this warrior, <laughs> there's going to be like dead bodies everywhere. <laughs> You know, it's not going to be a, a pretty scene. <laughs> and so Ezekiel says it's going to take seven months, actually. This is in Ezekiel 39, to cleanse the land. So he's using this atonement language to talk about the purification of the whole land and all the people and, like, cleansing and making this space clean. See what I'm saying? So that, too, is something that is deeper into the millennium. Like, that has to be some months later because Jesus doesn't come back and just, like, snap his fingers and, like, everyone's saved, everyone's clean, like, it's all done and all the feasts are fulfilled. And it's one of the reasons, too, why I've um, really been hesitant to endorse the view that, like, Jesus comes back on the Feast of Trumpets or the Day of Atonement in particular, even though a lot of people say that, because... When Jesus comes back, the things that he's doing are the exact opposite of what the Day of Atonement represents. The Day of Atonement is all about cleanliness and purity, and Jesus is coming back to literally shed people's blood and make kind of an unclean mess for a little while. <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean to be irreverent, but I just can't really square the idea of the Day of Atonement being fulfilled right when Jesus comes back because the Day of Atonement is all about this purification of sacred space and purification of the holy mountain and the people and all of that. And so, again, I see that Day of Atonement kind of more about what's happening after the nations are gathered and, and people are purified and why is all that happening? It's happening because... Jesus is making room for the return, if we can go to the next slide, of the glory of God to his temple. And that kind of brings us to the Feast of Tabernacles. And so the Feast of Tabernacles was the biggest festival of rejoicing. It was basically like a seven-day party. And if you go back to the time of Jesus, they were literally like having almost like a circus in Jerusalem during the Feast of Tabernacles. They were like juggling torches and lighting all these menorahs and 
that was when the fall harvest took place, so they were bringing all their food. So the Feast of Tabernacles is like when you get to just party and eat all the good food and rejoice. And God is saying that to them over and over, rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. It's like seven days of rejoicing. But it's also tied to this idea of you're rejoicing because you're recognizing that God is your king. He was enthroned at the Feast of Trumpets. His temple was purified on the Day of Atonement. And then on the Feast of Tabernacles, he's like formally establishing his presence. And he's like really there. And you can be confident that he's there. And he's providing for you. And you have all this food and all that kind of thing. So when you think about that fulfillment and how it points to the millennium and all of that, there's places like in Revelation 21.3 where John says, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. So there's these places where, and I, I love this, just like the Holy Spirit thing tends to not get emphasized, like the role of the Holy Spirit in the millennium. I think that the glory of God the Father on the earth in his temple in the millennium is not discussed or talked about enough because we often think about like the return of Jesus and we don't think about the return of the glory of God to the earth. But if you go in uh, Ezekiel chapter one, where Ezekiel has the vision of the glory of the Lord, um, I'm kind of a little, well, I don't know if it's a minority position or anything like that. But not everyone would be comfortable saying that Ezekiel saw a manifestation of God, of the Father. You see what I'm saying? Most people might want to say that Ezekiel just saw Jesus. I think you can argue otherwise. I think that the God of Israel, who we know as the Father, he exists. He can manifest in an actual glorious form. And I'm pretty sure that's what Ezekiel saw. Because then, if you read on in Ezekiel when he's talking after the temple is kind of purified and built, he says that he sees the glory of the God of Israel returning to the temple. So what Ezekiel saw in Ezekiel chapter 1 is what you and I get to see in the millennium when God the Father dwells again in his temple. It's the actual glory of God the Father However you want to work that out in your Trinitarian theology, I have no problem with it because I just see it in the Bible. But it's the actual glory of God the Father inhabiting his temple as Jesus is on his throne on Mount Zion, ruling the nations with his scepter as the Holy Spirit is working over the entire earth to renew everything and recreate everything we know about politics and architecture and music and miracles, that's, that's kind of the picture of the feast. And you can just see, again, it really flows really nicely when you start looking at all of the feast as kind of this roadmap for what Jesus is doing when he comes back. Passover warrior, feast of weeks, spirit, trumpets, we're all going up to Mount Zion to enthrone him atonement, everything being cleansed, and tabernacles, the space being prepared for the glory of God to come. And so that's the way I see it. It just seems so coherent. I, I can't really see it any other way. And I would not be the least bit surprised if Jesus comes back right before Passover. Um, there's many Jewish sources that say the Messiah is coming at that time. I wouldn't be the least bit surprised if Jesus comes back and just takes us one through one through the next, because it it kind of lent, the narrative kind of lends itself to that. But uh, we can leave those timing details to the Lord. I'll close just with First um, Peter one thirteen, and he says, uh, "Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit." Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So there is more grace to come. Jesus has not been fully revealed, and we are waiting and yearning and anticipating for the full revelation of Christ to all the nations. And the feasts are a really good 
dress rehearsal and anticipation and practice for all of that, which is why I, I love the feast and I just, I love how it unlocks um, so many beautiful elements of the storyline. Thank you so much, guys. <laughs>